and that's why it is that some of our graduates come out and make it big. Others that we anticipated great things didn't. Some seemingly sometime with uh, obviously less talent as far as uh, physical looks, personality, sometime like you, and yet they make it. And I've tried to analyze this now, having uh, had part in our Canadian life, Bible college for five years, graduating students, teaching many hours in the college. And uh, it's, uh, it's beyond me. I wish I could give you a frank appraisal. Uh, we had a young boy just recently that came to us from the open Bible. He married one of our four square girls and uh, began to attend my son's church in Eugene, which is called Faith Center. Of course, we're gospel, but primarily the slogan name is what the town knows it by. So uh, we had built a house with a double car garage big enough down in a city called Klamath Falls, Oregon, so that uh, if it was a failure, see, when you say, well, if it's a failure because you're dealing with human beings, not God in this case, uh, we could always make get our money back, you know, the people's money that we're investing. We put about $15,000 uh, into the house uh, at that time, which would be about uh, five or six years ago. Of course, it's worth about thirty five, forty thousand now. But anyhow, it, we got it at cost and everything. And, and frankly, I, my appraisal of him wasn't too good from the standpoint. I didn't know him too well, and he didn't seem to impress me very much. I mean, just talking to him, I liked him as a, you know, he's a, he, he was all right. There wasn't anything against him, you see. So uh, he had been down there about three or four weeks, and I got a call from him. He said, Brother Hicks, I don't know what to do. What's wrong? He said, uh, we're out of parking places already. I said, you got that big lot next door. Yeah, but uh, he went on and he started sharing some of his ideas. He said, we don't want to get that ready. He said, we'll be out of that. I said, how many people are you running? He said, 50. Where are you putting them? I said, <laughs> he said, that's it. So, uh, you know, things begin to, to go forward and to, pro to progress and, and um, got a medical doctor saved and there was an abandoned hospital in town on the on the the ideal spot for the whole city and doctor said I'll buy that and sell it to you for a tax write off and make a long story short they're going to be in a three story hospital with a first floor and an auditorium that seats 400 people building's worth a quarter of a million dollars and uh, he's up already to over 300 people and this is in a year's time and um, I, I wish that I could just sit up here and tell you, you know, here's a formula, go at it, folks. <laughs> but there are some basic concepts that's working today. And don't ask me why they're working. And I don't think they just work in certain parts of the country because some other parts of the country, such as Colorado, Ohio, and um, other places around here, no doubt, they're beginning to, to work some of these concepts, and they're not a lot different. Uh, it's just, there's enough difference there that God's blessing it. That's all I've got to say. And it, it seems that, um, what we talked to you about yesterday, you know, about, about just being directed by the Holy Spirit. Lord, what should I do today? If we're going to have a church service, what do you want to happen in this church service tonight, Lord? What, what shall we do first? And uh, another thing I've noticed also in these churches that's having this growth is they are, uh, quote, quote, controlling the gifts of the Spirit from the, from the, from the platform. Uh, this is a new concept. i uh, share just a little bit with... Brother Hagen yesterday about it, and he certainly concurs with it. Am I coming and going? All right, okay. If you can't hear me, well, put your hand up. 
for instance, in uh, several of our churches now that have had this growth, you do not give a message in tongues or prophesy without getting permission. You put your hand up. And the speaker will either recognize you or ignore you. And if he doesn't recognize you, you don't give it. Now, to me, that makes sense. Because we've allowed everything in the name of uh, the Holy Spirit to go on when it wasn't the Holy Spirit. It was somebody taking out their frustrations, proving their holiness by giving a message in tongues or, inter- or a prophecy. Now, no, and uh, this one church, even in some of our conventions we're having now, we're even calling on people to prophesy who, weren't, who didn't even put their hand up. And this blew some of the... We had a convention in Estes Park with about 800 people present, ministers present, and my son was leading, and he, he just, you know, all of a sudden he said, Stop, and pointed to one of the ministers from Indiana and said, Prophesy. Boy, he jumped on his feet and gave the word of the Lord, but blew their minds. Pentecost people never saw it on this fashion, you see. Uh, and then they judged the prophecy. In other words, if, of course, if it's, if it's, you know, if it's right on, everybody knows it's right on, nobody says anything, but if the uh, pastor says, is that all right, elders? Uh, now, you say, well, we're not overboard on elders. Don't misunderstand me here. The Bible, of course, has elders, you know. Uh, you Don't let somebody going overboard scare you from doing the right thing. And there is an eldership in the body of Christ. And there's submission in the body of Christ, and there's covering. But just don't let the pain pendulum swing over here, you see. And um, so I know that that's what's happening now. But it's not happening in our area. This is, uh, I was shocked to hear what's happening when I heard, since I heard some of the things that you're picking up down here. We're not having that trouble because we have everything in balance. But uh, they'll say, elders, is that all right? And, um, and the elders said, okay. And maybe if it isn't, one of them will stand up and say, uh, I, I think maybe the Lord has something further on that. Uh, or, you know, it just clarifies it so that the people know that everything is being done properly and in order. Uh, we've had so much uh, confusion down through the years. Pardon me, ladies. Uh, God bless you. We're happy that you're here. But it's, most of our confusion has come from uh, ladies uh, prophesying who, uh, who really... I, I really don't think had a valid gift. I think they exhorted us. You know, down in Pente- Pentecost, down through the years, usually had five messages, either in tongues, interpretation, or prophecy. One, uh, usually it was, one was judgmental. If you don't do so-and-so, I'm not going to do so-and-so, and I can't bless you because you're not doing so-and-so. The other one was the mission fields, white and the harvest, and the laborers are few. And the other one was, Lord, Lord is with us, and uh, just fear not. Remember one down in Arkansas, back in the hills there, where the fellow got up, and he said, there's fear in the east, and there's fear in the west, and there's fear in the north, and there's fear in the south. But thus saith the Lord, don't be a scared, because sometime I'm a scared myself, saith the Lord. And... Uh, <laughs> uh, we've just allowed everything to go on. So uh, the, the, the control of the service, the, the ordering of a divine service as the Holy Spirit would have it to be ordered. And again, we cannot overemphasize the worship. If there's any one key, that's it. We must get our people to worshiping God. We must lead them in worship. We must give time to worship. Uh, I don't like to see a song leader, and uh, this, this now, you, you have to be pretty good to be able to do this, so that you, you actually lead your people into worship and they don't even know they're doing it. You don't have to say, oh, come on, folks, let's give the Lord a praise offering. No, oh, forget it. If you've got to say that, they're not ready to praise God. Amen. They're not ready to praise God. If you go, oh, come on, folks, let's praise God. They're not ready. And, and it's going to be hollow and meaningless if they say, he said, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. See? And then it doesn't last long. And if it doesn't last long, the song leader or whoever's leading to try to get worked up again, you know, it's, 
he wants to pump it up a little bit, you know. And uh, we work it up from up here. But when you lead in worship, you see, the first thing you know is just the people are there. Hallelujah. And uh, it's not a matter of starting them. It's a matter of stopping them, and which you don't want to do either. So it's a new day from worship, and uh, I know Vep is doing such a good job, and you're learning a lot from him, and uh, you, you watch him closely. But I, I've also noticed, too, that there are very few song leaders and a pianist who can work together so that you, if you try to get in a key where you don't have to change keys. For instance, say, get your, if you're leading the worship service, get yourself about three or four worship courses in the same key so that you can go from one to other without having to turn and say to the, to the pianist a different key, or if you do flash a key at them, they can do it without too much difference, so that we're, we're leading people in worship and their minds upon the Lord. Because I, I said to my son one day, because they've done such a beautiful job down there, I said, uh, I go to some of these churches and I'm disturbed with people leading a worship service, trying to get the people pumped up. I said, uh, what's the answer? Well, he said, uh, one thing you can tell them, all the time they're talking, now as a song leader, all the time they're talking, the people are not worshiping. Now you, you think of that, see? All the time that man's talking, the people are not worshiping. You know, we're, we're getting our little cute cliches in, and, and we're trying to get response from the people, you know. And uh, did, you ever, did, you ever, did you ever try to analyze old Pentecost, what we used to do to try to get response from the people? Even, even it was, well, see, the song leader, he tried to get response. He tried to get the people shouting. Shouting at what? What he was saying. His little cuties. Right? You see, our little story he had learned. And then you see the fellow who made the announcement, he tried to get them responding to what he was saying. You know, so he was trying to get them. See, he was going to get the most shouts of the people over what they said. You follow me? Then the preacher got up, you see, and he had to get them all over on him responding to what he said. So he's got to get them shouting before he can preach. So they're trying to get them to respond, not to the Spirit of God, but trying to get them to respond to what they were saying. Now that's old Pentecost. See? I learned as a young pastor, I used to try to get the people worked up for the evangelist. Boy, I, boy, I, man, I, I guess, man, I learned the hard way. I was taught in school, you know, you get, you get, you get a good song service going, you get everything worked up and then turn the evangelist loose. Well, I discovered that after I got the people all worked up, they were responding to me. And then when the evangelist got up there, he had to turn around and get them to respond to them, which I thought was terrible the first time I saw it. I thought, man, he's done done everything I did. He told a joke. He got the people laughing. Then I saw. Then I, saw. I said, man, kind of lie. They taught me wrong in Bible college. You see, he's got to get them responding. He, he's got to get them flowing with him, not me. So I just lead a couple of songs and take the offer and say, it's yours. You see, then, then he got them going with his ministry, which, uh, which just does away with that old concept of, of getting the people to react to you. That's what they're doing. More they're reacting to you more than responding to you, you see, because you've got all these little cute niceties and cliches and funny things, and you get people out there and uh, they're responding to you. They're not worshiping God when they're responding to you. They're not. Now, you can get by with it and be known as a good song leader. And everybody said, boy, he's sure funny, you know. But what do you, what do you want in your church? What do you want to happen in your church? What's God going to build on in your church? I hope an atmosphere of worship, atmosphere of praise. And uh, just, just some of these things I'll share with you as I, as I see them coming. Now, at one of our churches, a, uh, this, there was a Quaker girl got, got converted I uh, feel the Holy Spirit and she's she's large man she's a black girl and she has she's big but you know she has a gift her gift is to get people to worship God I mean she has a gift not responding to her but she just gets up you know and she begins to sing beautiful voice and she begins to sing and she flows from one chorus to another and she gets some worship in God then she gets some praising the Lord but something lively or something like that and she just boy she just going from one thing to the other about 20 minutes and I tell you the people are ready for the word of God when she gets through now see the pastor saw that and she, he saw that ability in this uh, 
Quaker black girl that got baptized with the Holy Spirit. So she does most of the leading of his services because she's able, a gift of leading the people to worship God. Not leading a song service, but leading in worship and leading in praise. Now, it doesn't mean that everything has to be slow and everything has to be just, you know, uh, putting your hands up, but there could even be worship, and I thank God, uh, I agree with Brother Hagin, he said last night that many of these songs in the psalm books were not inspired of God. They just were not. You can read the words and find that out. Their doctrine was wrong, their theology was wrong, they just were not inspired of the Lord. And uh, yet, we down through the years, you know, we did nothing but sing from the hymn book. Why in the world we didn't sing more from Scripture? I don't know. It just this is something that God has given to us. And uh, I don't agree with all the scripture courses because I think somebody just got said on one day, said, well, everybody else is doing it, I can do it. And they started singing something there. And it just didn't take, it didn't catch. But there are some greatly inspired courses, scripture courses that we're singing today that God will bless by the Holy Spirit. And so you need to learn which one, and not all of them. They're good to sing them, but they're not all really being used by the Holy Spirit in worship. So learn these. Uh, I would recommend uh, that, you, that you send to uh, the, the Church on the Way in Van Nuys, California and get Jack Hayford's uh, compilation of, uh, of courses. Now, VEP can give you that address. You, you have a book, don't you? You have them there? You will have them. Good. Tell Jack I told him to give them to you 40 cents a piece instead of a dollar, and uh, get them for the students. And he will if you just write him and tell him we want some song books. He might even give them to you. Just uh, say I suggested that he might. <laughs> they give away, average, they give away about four or five hundred dollars a week uh, free material out of that church every week. That's one of their ministries. And uh, you, you, you put that down, ask that, to tell him about the students here and see if they won't, he won't give them one of these books, song books. And most of them are of course, is that they just picked up and notice they don't have. Do you notice in that book they don't have the names of the people in that that wrote those? It's a new day, folks. It's a new day. Hallelujah! If you make a contribution to the kingdom of God, keep your name off of it. You know, just let it go through without your name being on it, and let God receive the glory and the praise. It's a little hard on the flesh, you know. You're singing one of the courses my boy wrote. But I'm not going to tell you which one it was. It's just a new day, and I'm, I'm enjoying every minute of it. Now, the worship, of course, is so important. You lead your people in worship. And then now we'll turn to the fourth chapter of Ephesians. And you've already considered this, I'm sure. But verse 11, for he hath uh, set some in the church, or the gifts of Christ that we're talking about, in Ephesians 4:11, And uh, you, you know them? What's the first one? Second? Apostles, I have to say it with you. Apostles? prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. For the what? For the perfecting, no, no, for the, till we all see, for perfecting the saints. Yep, but I get mixed up, I better go back and read it. For the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. Now, I, I'm sure you've studied this. Have you studied this already? And you know that other translations have this clear for the perfecting of the saints that they, the saints, might do the work of the ministry. Is that right? Have you been taught that? Well, you say yes or no. No. All right, who has a translation that makes it clear? Anybody have Amplified? Come up here, please, and read Amplified on that so we'd be sure and get this right. And his and his gifts were varied. He appointed he, and his gifts were varied. He himself appointed and gave men to us, some to be apostles, special messengers, some prophets, inspired preachers and expounders, some evangelists, preachers of the gospel, traveling missionaries, some pastors, shepherds of his flock, and teachers. His intention was the perfecting and the full equipping of the saints, his consecrated people that they should do the work of ministering toward building up the Christ's body of the church. They. They who? The saints. Is this confirmed in Scripture? Yes, it is. In the sixth chapter of the book of Acts, you will read there where Peter 
And uh, James and John, when there was a murmuring among the widows of neglecting the food distributions, they said, it is not right that we should leave the word of God to serve tables. Wherefore, look out among you seven men of honest report and full of the Holy Ghost whom we may appoint over this matter. Well, these men that they chose were men of honest report and full of the Holy Ghost, and they also had the gifts of the Spirit at work in their lives, didn't they? Because Philip and Stephen and these men were great gifted men of the Holy Ghost, you see, but they were doing the work of the ministry. Uh, this is very significant to me because I was taught when I went through the preacher factory that when we were building a church that I was to get my overalls on and get my hammer and I was to get down and roll up my sleeves and do, you know, prove myself with these people. Well, I was taught that way and I did that for years and years. And finally, some of my, some of my good saints were smarter than I was. And I, I came along one day and they said, what are you doing down here? <laughs> well, I thought I'd help. They said, we don't need you. you. Got some calls you need to make? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Got your sermon for tomorrow? Well, not quite. Well, we'll do this. You go ahead. Hallelujah. Bless God. Well, that's scriptural. That's scriptural, you see. Now, they, the saints, might do the work of the ministry. Now, who equips them? Got Christ's gifts, apostles, prophets. They are the ones that, uh, that do the perfecting of the saints. Their ministry, therefore, the perfecting of the saints would be the, the teaching ministry, the evangelistic ministry, the pastoral ministry, the prophetic ministry, or sent ones. Sent ones includes anyone who's an apostle in that broad term. Uh, there are some uh, that's getting a little overboard on that one, by the way, and some fellows are proclaiming themselves to be apostles now. So uh, I, I suppose it's scriptural. You can't fuss with it. But I think if they interpret it wrongly, it's going to be a bad thing. If you just uh, stick with the, the interpretation of the word apostle, a sent one. You see, a sent one. Uh, I could be an apostle to you if I say the right thing. <laughs> if, I don't say the wrong, if I don't say the right thing, forget it, you know. Or Brother Hagin could come along and be an apostle to you, as well as a prophet. In other words, if you use the broad term, the sent one, Christ sends certain people, certain places, certain times to add, to expand, you see, in, in, in the teaching of the saints and perfecting of the saints, that they, the saints, might do the work of the ministry. Uh, I really believe that we have something to learn here. Now, uh, you have to be careful what you say. You, you see, if you use this as a cop-out, now if I say, probably, you should not be doing the visitation in your church, you say, who's going to do it then? Who's going to do the visitation in my church? Well, can't you train some people in your church to do that? You see? Uh, you say, well, who's going, to, who's going to go out and win souls? Can't you train some people in your church to do that? You see? One of our churches has a constant, they had one man trained to do nothing but teach soul winning class. And they teach Love It's System. How many have, how many have Love It's book? Uh, all of you should get it, by the way. And you should teach that, if you, that or another system, whichever system you want to teach. Teach a soul-winning system to your people. So they are winning people to the Lord. Now, another thing that's going great in some places, and again, you see the pendulum may swing too far, but the ladies are having what they call coffee clutches. Does anybody know anything about that? Coffee clutches, where uh, they come in and have a Bible study. Now, and these are the coffee clashes that we're having up our way. The ladies are not allowed to talk about the church. You can't talk about the four-square church, the assembly church, the Catholic church. The word church can never be brought up, never. And you cannot talk about weight. You cannot talk about your family. And you cannot talk about your husband. And you cannot talk about your children. There's only one thing we can talk about. And that's the Bible. This church is one that's gone from about 50 or 60 to over 1,100. And much success can be given 
to the fact that the ladies have won the other wives. The husband comes home and sees the difference in his wife and says, where? What, what group is this? Well, she said, uh, this is a group over here, but I thought maybe we'd like to, you'd like for us to go to your church this morning. Oh, that church is dead, you know. Well, let's try that one out, you see. Or maybe it might be another church. But you see, they never invite them to come to their church. There's another concept, you see, that we've never been taught. They are never invited to come to that church. They're only invited to receive Jesus as their Savior and then get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Where, where you think they're going to go to church, you see? They're free to go wherever they want to go. Maybe you don't want them in your church. Boy, we better learn that one, too. You don't want anybody in your church that Jesus doesn't want there. And so you quit putting pressure on people to come to your church. Amen. And you trust Jesus to build your church. Boy, you lose what looks like to be some mighty good people once in a while. They're going over here, you know, and boy, you just always oh, should love to have you in our church. Oh, how do you know you'd love to have them in your church? They may clash with some of your people. May not, they may not be a blessing to you. So the perfecting of the saints, that they, the saints, might do the work of the ministry, is something you need to study. Study it in the context of the Bible. This does not do away with your ministry. You'll always be the gift. Teach your people when you go to a church to pastor that you are, just get up and just smile as big as you can and say, well, you lucky people, I'm your gift. That's right, you are. You are their gift. Whose gift? Jesus' personal gift. I am your gift. What do you have to do to a gift to receive it? you got to open it up. Teach your people to open you up. Teach your people to open you up, to find out what you're made of, and to explore you, and to get the best out of you they can get. Teach them to open up their pastor. You know, a lot of churches never opened up their pastor. They criticize him, criticize the package he comes in, <laughs> and criticize his wife, but they never really opened up the pastor. As a result, pastors be very transparent. Don't hide. Don't, 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 make, don't pass yourself off to be perfect. If you blew it that week, why don't you just get up and tell them you did? Say, you know, folks, I did a stupid thing this week. Huh? Our pastor did a stupid thing. Yeah, you know, I ran out of gas. I'm always running out of gas. You know, well, don't try to hide it from your people, you see. If you're always running out of gas and doing the stupid thing, they'll be so relieved to know that you're human like they are. You see? Or if the wife burnt the biscuits, you get up and tell them, have fun. Say, my wife burns the biscuits. Or the toast or whatever it is. But I love her. You see? And that, that'll make some husband out there say, well, my wife's the same. But I guess I love her too, you know? Uh, and so, you, you see... Uh, you, you, now, this is why some of our pastors, I'm, I'm not advocating this, but uh, some of our pastors are um, not, uh, they're not afraid of being caught with, a, with, a, with a, just a sports shirt on. They're not afraid to even make a hospital call with a sports shirt on. That isn't just something they're deliberately doing. They're just trying to be themselves. After all, you see, the only reason they are powerful is because Jesus made them powerful. Not the way they dress, or the authority. I'm the pastor. You jump. Okay. No, they're the pastor because they're Jesus' gift to the church. And he will only give that church through them. See? The gifts of Christ flow through the pastor. And I'm not talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you see. But when Jesus has a great truth to share, it's going to come through the pastor in his leadership and the feeding of the flock. And when they learn that and they learn to respect you because you are not just a man uh, with a big degree behind your name, you are their pastor. And it kind of blows a lot of people's minds when a lot of them are being called by their first name. And so the saints, I was taught in, I was taught in Bible college, never under any circumstance let anybody call you by your first name. Well, 
it was probably right for back then. But nowadays, you know, most of our pastors are going by their first names. You say, what's that doing? It's not doing anything but just causing the people to have a very affectionate word for their pastor. He's not reverend, which puts him out here in left field somewhere, you see. He's Jerry. He's Tom. But he's my pastor. Come over and meet my pastor, Tom. You say, oh, I just could never get used to that. Well, you've got to believe that. And you've got to believe that you are going to be Christ's gift to that little congregation. You've got to believe that Christ is going to bless that congregation through you. You've got to believe that. And that he will give you great and wonderful things to share with them. And you can get down before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to feed the sheep in the morning. What shall we give them? And he's, he's obligated to give you something for those sheep. You don't have to, you don't have to, to, to study and study and study and prepare eight hours to get it either. And if you don't get anything, if you really believe that you're the pastor, Christ's gift to your flock, you can get up in the morning and by faith open up your mouth and some goodies will come out of it. That's not a cop out. You know, read your Bible and pray all the time. You know that. So these are some of the things that we just want to do to share with you this morning concerning present day 70s ministry. That it's not a, a lot different. The church is still the church. People are still the people. Pastor is still the pastor. Uh, the concepts uh, uh, that very little bit are the, let's don't camouflage, let's don't hide behind that term, reverend and pastor, let's don't hide behind it and hide all of our weaknesses. Let's be open and frank and honest and transparent and uh, teach the people that you can be a human being and be blessed of God. Amen. Years ago, the evangelist popped out of a, you know, whatever, a great big white suit, you know, and uh, boy, he swept the people. My goodness alive, they sat back. <gasps> you know, I, I remember, and I'm not saying anything about Oral Roberts, it just happened, he was, happened to be the evangelist. And, and you know, they all came to hear Oral Roberts. They didn't come to hear Jesus. And if somebody got up and made an announcement and said, I'm sorry, well, Mr. Roberts can't be here tonight. Bob DeWeese is going to be speaking. Ah, oh, let's go home. You see? The concept was wrong. The concept was wrong, you see. You know, those people weren't healed just because Mr. Roberts were there. Was there, they were healed because Jesus was there. But see, we were looking to a man. And that's why almost every divine healing evangelist that was very, very prominent in the 40s and 50s. Out of 125, about the only one left is Kenneth Hagin. See? Because he, he had the big tents to start with and the, all this stuff going. But, you know, he saw something. He saw that he was praying for the same people the next week who apparently got delivered last week. And he said, Lord, I, th I can't do this. What's the use of praying for these people, get them healed, and they can turn around next week and pray for them again? Well, the Lord said, the only thing you do is teach him my word. And so he just got rid of all that stuff and just started out teaching the word, teaching the word. And so he's the only one left that has a valid divine healing ministry because the rest of the people got, uh, the rest of the evangelists, they were so successful in getting the people's eyes on them. They had so many little ways of doing this. They always started praying for somebody hard of hearing in one ear. You want me to develop? You, you don't want me to develop that, folks. It'll shock you if I do. It'll shock you if I do. Nowadays, it's lengthening, le lengthening legs. But you see, we do so many things to call attention to ourselves. You see, we say that Jesus lengthened the leg, but you know who they're looking at, don't you? Hmm? Nothing wrong with lengthening the leg as long as the Lord gets the praise. Amen. It's all right. That's that's okay. I'm not saying anything about that, but. We've made the awful mistake down through the years of trying to be somebody we wasn't. And so we need, we need to come back to a concept of just being ourselves. And we are the gift, evangelist or teacher or prophet. We are the gift of Christ to the church. But we are human. We are ourselves. We are transparent. Praise the Lord. Okay, We've got 15 minutes here and be happy to talk with you but I just wanted to answer a question then we'll come back to you someone wrote a note and they wanted to know about the divorce thing I believe if I remember this question that was written in by one of you it was uh, there's a Christian both are Christians 
the woman has been divorced. What about remarriage? Let me just tell you what you will do to your ministry. Uh, if a man divorces his wife but does not remarry, he cuts down his effectiveness about 25 percent. If a man divorces and remarries, he cuts down his effectiveness another 50 percent, which means 75 percent gone. If he makes a tragic mistake that Wendell Wallace made and marries a black marrying a white or a white marrying a black, he cuts his effectiveness down to zilch, almost nothing. Now it is true that you can have in our day and age somewhat of a ministry, but you are cutting yourself back, really cutting yourself back. If you do that, we won't go into the ramifications, what's right or what's wrong. I'm talking about ministry, and I'm talking to students. I'm not talking about what you should preach. I'm talking about students who want to go into the ministry. You will cut down your effectiveness to a large percentage of people if you get involved in a divorce. Okay? I guess they want you to come to the microphone. And, and, uh, Brother, you said a while ago that... Uh, teach your people to open up the pastor. I'd like for you to explain that just a little bit. I've found in my experience with pastoring the last three years that there are some times that you just don't get too personal with people because it causes lots of trouble in the body. That's a, that's a wonderful observation. I believe that the reason why that happened and did happen down through, I was taught that too, by the way. And uh, I believe the reason why that happens is because we haven't had the right teaching yet that we are their gift. Now, in your case, let's say, I would teach that Ephesians 4 there until it ran out their ears. I would teach that. When the evangelist came along, I would teach my people, this man is Jesus' personal gift to us this week. Let's open him up. Can't open him up if you stay home. Amen? Let's get out every night. Let's bring people out. The pastor, teach them that you are Christ's personal gift to them. And uh, then, then go into transparency. And that uh, you're not to teach them to be as you are. You're to teach them to be like Christ. And you're all working for the same goal. And you'll be improving along with the rest of them. Half the sermons you'll get will be for yourself as well as them. You see? But when you get into this, this transparency, I have found in... The men that's doing this, boy, you talk about loving their pastor. I know one case they laugh about that. Well, well, he's always late, but we love him. You know, we love him. And they've learned what his weaknesses are. And they love him more because they've got weaknesses, you see. But if you teach that concept that the pastor is Christ's gift to that group of people and be yourself, you'll find they will really appreciate you because you're Christ's gift to them. Does that help any? Teach them that you are the gift first, then become transparent. <laughs> Don't become transparent first. Okay? Try it and let me know what happens. Yes. Going back to the uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit, and uh, the minister recognizing the ones in the congregation. Uh, I have a reason I'm asking this, and it's not completely uh, manifested yet, but I found that uh, this is what I felt was lacking on the minister's part, are the pastors not recognizing in the congregation uh, the ones that could have been used with the gifts are either telling them to sit down and shut up uh, publicly and offending the people, and uh, I wondered how you would handle this without uh, making a scene or being offensive. Well, yes, uh, we got some beautiful illustrations of this. The uh, way I handled it one time, and then I've seen others do it too, is when the person got through, it was, it was painful, painfully obvious to everybody that they were out of order and. Uh, and so I just said, I'd like to see you in my study after church. And uh, this happened here a while back where a lady got up with a judgmental prophecy, 
really, boy, she ripped the people up, one side and down the other. And all the pastor said, uh, I'll see you in my office in the morning at 9 o'clock. But not, did not say anything publicly, did not uh, rebuke them publicly. So we would certainly encourage the encouragement rather than the... And some of these people have a valid gift. They really do. They haven't learned to prophesy out of their spirit. They're prophesying out of their head so that they need to be taught to prophesy out of their spirit. So I think in the control we will have a much uh, better quality of the prophetic gifts operating, vocal gifts especially, operating in our church services. I know that many times uh, some people are giving messages to tongues, they don't know when to stop. They can start talking in tongues and go for five minutes. And they need somebody to go to them and say, you're giving a message, not a sermon. Shut up. Just sit down after you give a, a message and sit down. If you want to give another one after that, let somebody interpret that one. Because they, they place a horrible responsibility upon the interpreter to go five or ten minutes. We is only capable of going one. You see, so we just need teaching. But the public control will teach the people we're going to control this, we're going to teach it, we're going to handle it in love, and we will come out of this thing on top. Amen. But not to ever embarrass anybody publicly under any circumstance. Well, if you have a question, maybe to save time, just come over here and, and just stand in front of the microphone, and then uh, we'll just move right on. Because uh, people begin to come in, and we only have ten minutes left here. Would you speak briefly on the person in the denominational church who receives a baptism and he sits under a ministry that he's not getting fed under? In fact, you know, he's hearing many negative things from the pulpit. Now, we have many people who are in a state of consternation throughout America today. They receive mm -hmm. a baptism. I've Personally, uh, at the time I received it, I stayed with it, not because I wanted to, mm -hmm. but because I didn't feel the Lord had released me. Then I felt he had released me, so I moved on. But I have felt now, uh, as I've sought the Lord, that this charismatic renewal that we're seeing is for the church. It's for every church. Mm -hmm. It's not for certain denominations, or we're not to pull out and wait for the rapture and sit out That's here right. under anointed teaching. Would you speak on what we can do, how we can encourage those in denominational churches uh, who have this feeling of, of what am I going to do and how we can encourage them without pulling them out because we don't need to pull them out of their churches, I don't believe. What we need to do is encourage them in their faith and uh, get some good teaching into it. Well, I think there's an area of balance here. I think you've answered it. It's just simple that every man works out his own salvation with fear and trembling. There's not a certain rule that you can lay down. There's some people, they need to get right out of that church because they're not strong enough to take that negative stuff. The other people are strong enough and they need to stay in there. Maybe eventually the pastor will get filled with the Holy Spirit. So there's no blanket rule on this. Some people have stayed too long and uh, they should have gotten out, you see, and some got out and they should have stayed. So uh, again, uh, there is this great truth of submission and you can only submit yourself where the, where, the, where the truth is being taught. So it is a big question right now, just uh, what to, how, how do you advise people? I don't think there's any one single answer to it, do you? I think that we've got to ask them to seek God's will and to really, really believe with them that God will give them. And I think they'll know when to leave. And when the pastor gets up and calls them out by name and said they're no longer welcome in this church, I think it's time to leave. And that's happening, by the way. That's happening, by the way. I think it'd be best for them to stay, uh, leave before that happens. And we just had a man, a Baptist man in uh, Corvallis, Oregon, got filled with the Holy Spirit. He's gone in, had many talks with his pastor. He loves him. The pastor said, I want nothing to do with it. I don't want it being spread in my church. And it probably would be better if you did leave. So he left. But he did go to his pastor and talk about it. So that's good advice, too. Uh could you share a couple points, uh, practical points, um, on how a pastor is to teach his congregation that he is Jesus' gift to them? Just some everyday practical points of how maybe a pastor would do it, how you've seen pastors do it, and uh, how it was successful, or how you would do it yourself. Well, it's just enlarging on the question back there again that you, you must believe that you are, first of all. And that means that you believe that you're in the right place. Uh, we use Danny here. I happen to know that he just took over a little church out here. 
Boy, I tell you, the, the, the biggest asset he'll ever have, I don't know if he's even got it yet, I haven't talked to him enough to know if he's got it, but the biggest asset he's going to have is to believe he's in God's will where he is. Now, if he's wrestling with that, I wouldn't get up and teach anything. I just keep trying to find out whether or not I'm in God's will. And when he can find out that he's in God's will to be in the place that he's in, he's there to sink or swim, live or die, and not to move on if there isn't success. If he believes that he's God's or Christ's gift to that congregation, then he begins to act that way. He begins to teach that way. I am here as Christ's gift to you. I am the pastor. You see, now in his case, uh, more or less a layman, as I understand it. Right? You didn't go to Bible college. Okay, he's a layman, more or less. But he is now a gift, you see. And that makes him as important as any man with a degree behind his name. If he is Christ's gift, then there's not going to be, and he should never apologize for not going to Bible college. He should never apologize for not having all this experience. If God put him where he is, then he is God's gift to that church. And he's got to act like it, and he's got to talk like it. Now, that doesn't mean he'll step up there and be somebody he isn't. In fact, he's got a lot going for him, and almost envy him, because he can start from the ground floor and believe that and know it's to be the truth. Because he doesn't have anything to offer that people unless it is Christ. See, some of us, we go through school, we think we've got a lot, you know, got at least three sermons to start with, you see. I doubt if he had any. <laughs> so, you see, he begins to teach the people that, and together Christ will build his church. Christ is the one that builds the church, not Danny, you see. And boy, he needs to get that across. And if he doesn't have any growth at all for the first year, he's not going to sweat it at all. He won't sweat it. And if somebody says, well, I guess your church is about the same size. No, he said, we're building the kingdom of God. We're getting people saved all over the community. Well, where are they going? doesn't matter to us where they're going. Let Christ put them where he wants them. But see, he's got confidence. And man, he can get up on a Sunday morning. If there's only two people that preach as good as if there's a hundred there. Because he's in God's will, he's Christ's gift to the church, he acts like it, he talks like it, and he believes it. And he's transparent. He's never going to act like he's a great big uh, degree theologian. He's just Christ's gift to the church. So I, I hope that helps a little bit, you see. You've got to believe it. You've got to believe that you are. Amen. And when you believe that, I believe that you're well on your way to receiving some things from God that's going to be a great blessing to your people. If you'll turn to Psalm 68, 18, this is, this is the answer to the whole thing right here. Uh, I never understood this until I came to school, and, and the Lord showed it to me. It says, Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts for men. All right, we're relating this to Ephesians 4. Mm -hmm. And he says, Thou hast given gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also. I never understood, yea, for the rebellious also. It didn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Until you understand that the gift is the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, mm -hmm. the and the pastor. And they are given to the rebellious also that mm -hmm. they can come into the kingdom. Good. This is what this means. Good. Thank you for sharing that. Amen. Beautiful. Praise God. And listen, when you're pastoring, when you're pastoring, don't fail to let your people share goodies like that. And don't feel, oh, I wish I'd have thought of that. Boy, be happy. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Boy, some morning your people may, you may get up to preach and say, you know, I just don't I just feel like somebody has something to share. And somebody out there has got something better than you had. Well, say, praise God. Amen. Be transparent. And don't try to make something better than what they had. We're guilty of that, you know. Somebody gets up and gives a good, beautiful thing from the Lord, and you say, yes, but, and, if. And we try to, you know, make him look small. But just, just be transparent. Do you see any difference in communicating with the young people today, say, against back in the 40s and the 50s? And if so, would you comment on that for a pastor or evangelist? Do I see any difference? No, not really. Uh, back in the 40s and 50s, they sat there because they had to. Today, they're sitting there because you love them. And I think that's the key word. You know, these young people, they sense immediately if you love them. Immediately if you love them. And you can't hide that from these young people. I don't know what they've got a built-in sixth sense that determines immediately if you looked at them and wished they'd cut their hair. Huh? Or you love them. And they can tell it just like that. Just like that, they can tell it. So it's love. 
It's really is love. Uh, if you uh, begin to sing that chorus yet, turn the hearts of the children to the parents. Turn the hearts of the parents to the young. Turn the hearts of us all to one another. Turn the hearts of the people to the Lord. That's uh, Malachi. You all learn that. It's a beautiful verse of Scripture. Brother, I've got a kind of a case in point I'd like to share concerning the rebellious. Even the very ones we started out with in our church, which was very few, uh, one time during a serious church problem, one of them came to me and says, We know that God sent you here, <laughs> but we know that God sent us here. And they said, What are you going to do about it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, uh, and I, I don't know how you'd handle that too much in independent situations. Might be good sometime to have the brethren around you who can, you know, support you and hold you up like that. Because that has happened so many times. I said, we got here first, brother. See, uh, what I believe in this case is we got to be willing to turn loose of a lot of people. And I, I encourage my pastors. I stick with the pastors. If they will believe they're God's gift to that church, I will stick with the pastor and let the layman go their way. And they, they, if they're going to be rebellious, you're not going to teach them anything anyhow. So I would say keep believing your, your Christ's gift to them and, get, and with authority minister to them. And uh, you're in God's will. Praise the Lord. Well, time is gone. Is it Ken? <laughs> Anybody else? I thought I saw a hand. No hands? Which one? Pardon? You mean the clapping of the hands? Oh, okay. What is it, 95th Psalm? Is it? Somebody, read, give me the first line. Huh? What's the first line? Oh, yeah, oh, come. All right. Let's stand singing. Come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord, to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise unto him. For the Lord is our great God, and Jesus is our King. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord, to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise unto him. For the Lord is our great God, and Jesus is our King. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Beautiful, okay? Go get your coffee. Christian rebuked him by the name of Jesus. Who made which one? Of the of the Oh. Well, he put a curse of sickness on the Christian there. Hey, which one's going to lead in the opening this service this morning? Y'all remember who it was? Gary England, we let you do it. Get with your pianist and get you some core. I would say this, yeah, it's an automatic thing. They, they see the
gospel church? I mean, I mean, uh, a business man. Yeah, yeah. Praise the Lord. Hold on. 